uh, I guess, theoretical frameworks, which is the, the name you come up with when you can't think of a better name for the session. Um, but it's uh, big pictures. Uh, for our next speaker, we have uh, we have uh, Ken Modi from uh, from Sony in uh, Japan. Ken is uh, many of you may know his uh, his website, the Qualia Manifesto. Dot com, and he was even in, he was uh, indirectly responsible for the uh, for the famous high-end brand at, at Sony, Sony Qualia, which sadly got uh, discontinued uh, a few years ago. So it's now I guess Sony Zombies. But uh, but uh, Ken is going to talk to us today about the contingent brain. Uh, uh, well. Uh, it's been always good to look back at history. Uh, you know, alchemy, uh, even Isaac Newton was very enthusiastic about alchemy, um, but they actually lacked an understanding of the first principles. However, the techniques and the endables actually became a problem to modern chemistry, so we should thank the alchemist for that. Now, brain science. Uh, we really don't know anything about, you know, how that you know, consciousness or mind is journeyed from the firing of billions of neurons in the brain. So we also lack an understanding of the first principles. But we could be, if we try very hard, uh, for us to the science of consciousness in the future. So that's what we are trying to do here. Uh, so Claudia, uh, as David said, it used to be the brand name for hand co uh, products from Sony Corporation, uh, but it's now discontinued. But Korea uh, actually as the as the hallmark of consciousness, and uh, it's the holy grail, so to speak, of all our endeavors. And uh, you know, uh, Australia has produced many philosophers, including David himself, uh, who said many interesting things about Korea. Frank Jackson, I think, is one of the you know uh, first people who pointed out that conventional forms of knowledge are not sufficient to explain the origins of Korea. And David Smith, of course, I uh, keep it for this argument about uh, our problem consciousness and philosophical zombies. The problem with modern brain science is that you know, we're treating the brain as if it is an organ for zombies. So you know, your brain scientists really don't care about you know, consciousness. You know, if there's a consciousness or there's not consciousness, it doesn't really make sense, uh, make any difference in today's you know, cognitive brain science. And that's the problem with us. You know, we are still alchemists, so to speak. Because we don't know why and why, how, should uh, consciousness arise from the activities in the brain. Anyway, um, I think you know, we should be really thankful for these people, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch, because I think these are uh, you know, one of the people who, who made uh, consciousness studies respectable by publishing uh, papers in such journals as Nature. Um, they put forward this uh, concept of neural points of consciousness, which is um, a very empirical approach. Uh, we can measure brain activities using ching unit recording, uh, fMRI, and so on. And we can ask what is the relationship between phenomenological, phenomenological experiments and brain activities. So at least we can do that. But what are the first principles? Well, um, I think uh, in approaching the neural points of consciousness, the responsivity of neurons has been the two factor central dogma. Anyway, in the simple version, when an activity of a neuron selected to a particular stimulus property is involved, the conscious perception of that property is also involved. And this is sometimes referred to as a neuron doctrine. More, in a more general form, when the spatial temporal pattern of neurons selected to a particular stimulus property is generated, the conscious perception of that property is involved. Uh, uh, actually, I spent some time with this uh, very wonderful person, Horace Barrow, in Cambridge. And he put forth this uh, very famous neuron doctrine, which is uh, in a very simple form, uh, you know, kind of an idea that ultimately it might be a single nerve cell in the highest sensory areas, selectively responding to a particular property of the tumor that. Uh, it, uh, is ultimately responsible for uh, perception, whether conscious or unconscious. So uh, this has, I think, uh, this idea of response selectivity or stimulus selectivity has helped the neuroscientists in the many years uh, that we have been involved, and uh, it is a useful idea, certainly. 
But uh, I should argue here that uh, the concept of response relativity, although useful in analyzing data from single unit recording to fMRI, is ultimately inadequate in providing the first principles behind the origin of consciousness. And I would argue that, in fact, overcoming the experimental and theoretical abuse of response activity might be the single most important obstacle to be overcome in consciousness studies. Why is that? Well, let's uh, start from this immediacy hypothesis, which I hope you would agree. Uh, namely, the phenomenological content of a subject at a particular species moment is determined by, and only by, the properties of physical properties of the subject's brain at that moment. Well, this at that moment term is kind of tricky, but I'll come to that later. Why is uh, response selectivity inadequate? Well, uh, the, I would put uh, two critiques of response selectivity based on the immediacy hypothesis. One, uh, response selectivity can be established only through the analysis by an external observer. The subject cannot be immediately aware that the particular firing pattern of the neuron in his brain is selective to, for example, a rose. Uh, secondly, um, response selectivity is established in essence as a statistical property. The selectivity to a bar, like in the primary visual cortex, of a certain orientation can be empirically established only by the exposure to and comparison with the activities invoked by girls of different orientations. Uh, such a statistical property is not immediately available for the subject at a particular psychological moment and cannot constitute the immediate cause of the phenomenological experience. So I'm just saying that, you know, although the stimulus or response activity, although it is a certainly a useful idea in analyzing experimental data and so on, because it is a statistical uh, idea based on the concept of ensemble, it cannot satisfy the immediacy hypothesis. So it cannot really be the ultimate cause of you know, what we call consciousness. So I would argue that due to the statistical nature and dependency on the third-person viewpoint of response activity, it is not tenable as the first principle to explain the origin of consciousness. So we need an alternative data. Uh, here. Uh, well, let's look uh, back at the history again. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, exchange of ideas between uh, Ernst Mach and Albert Einstein. Uh, Ernst Mach, among other things, was a very excellent philosopher, like some of you guys here. And there was this very interesting transfer from, uh, of ideas from philosophy to science. Uh, this is the famous Marx principle. Uh, in this original form, it is kind of ab ambiguous in the modern context. So I would uh, show you the uh, Marx principle as restated by Hermann Bondi and Joseph Samuel. Basically, the uh, Marx principle is that the property of an individual cannot be determined on its own. Uh, you know, the property of an individual entity can be only defined in terms of its relationship between other entities in the universe, and so on. From this uh, Marx principle, Albert Einstein drafted his uh, theory of uh, relativity, and uh, Einstein was very thankful to uh, Marx for that. And he wrote in his letter to Ernst Marx that, um, you know, for example, inertia originates in the kind of interaction between the bodies. Um, it was this kind of very deductivistic philosophy that was behind this uh, groundbreaking theory of reactivity that Albert Einstein put forward. Well, I would argue here that we need something equivalent to that. Uh, you know, we need to you know go back to a very basic uh, uh, question: what, what on earth makes a neuron special? Does it make special because? It's that neuron has a response selectivity to a particular stimulus property? I don't think so. That is kind of very misleading uh, line of thought. Uh, I would argue that uh, the neuron is special because of its relationship with other neurons in the brain. Namely, uh, Max Prince in perception states that the phenomenological properties of the mind of the subject at a particular species moment is determined by and not only by the mutual relation between the neural activities in the subject's uh, brain at that particular moment. So, for example, uh, you know, people talk a lot about um, color constancy, used to talk a lot about co color constancy, and we know that in area V4, uh, we have neurons that are, uh, you know, tuned to